Hello, everybody. Welcome back to How Come. This week's episode is about music and orgasms and how the two come together. (laughs) Um, You may have noticed we have been posting more on our Instagram and we've been posting clips from the podcast, but also reels from other creators that we've sourced from like TikTok or Instagram, la la, whatever. And the reels usually have to do with sex or something funny and And all the videos do fine. They do fine, you know? However, there was one video that we posted a few weeks ago that went so fucking viral, it made my head spin. The video is from Vaughn. She's a musician, and it's her singing along to her song, Tiny Boy. And it says, made this song with a vibrator by recording my own orgasm wave patterns and making bass sounds out of them. Everything's better when you DIY. And upon seeing this, I was like, oh my God, I know how she did this. And let's post about it because I'm sure a bunch of companions will also know if they've been listening for a long time. And like I said, it went so so very viral. It reached a lot of people that have never even heard of How Come. Um, A lot of people that love the video, a lot of people that did not like the video at all. Um, And so we invited Vaughn on to talk about that and to talk about how she makes her music and a lot of great other stuff that we weren't even expecting. Um, At different points in this episode, we'll be like, oh yeah, go look at the comments under it. So if you are looking for the post, it is in our reels section, not in our hard post section. So um, hard post is all of our like clips from the podcast. They're not, they're not that viral, but we, I mean, I understand this is more of like a listening podcast. It's not that, it's not that clippable. Um, And then if you go to reels and scroll down just a little bit, like three scrolls. It's got 1.7 million views at this point and 91,000 likes. Crazy. Um, so yeah, we loved having Vaughn on. You guys are going to love this episode. Again, it is still pride. So there are some pride themes in here. Uh, and yeah, let's get it started. How come? How come? How come I can't achieve? How come I can't achieve? I'm rolling up my sleeves. I'm rolling up my sleeves. Oh, baby, I believe these guests can help. Cause I can't do it by myself. I wanna just. This episode is gonna be amazing. I'm so excited to get started. Welcome, Vaughn. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Oh my God. Your video is like the first TikTok to have really blown up on our page. And wait, love. <laughs> literally, like, I was like, oh my God, I have to learn how to like filter comments and like. <laughs> oh my God. It's so interesting, right? It's wild. Yeah. So I stumbled upon a TikTok of yours a few weeks ago, and the caption was, I used my orgasm waveform to make music. And in the background, it's playing your song, Tiny Boy. And I was like, one, this slaps. And two, (laughs) I love that you used a waveform. And obviously, we know where those come from. But long story short, We reposted the video. It went super viral on our page because a lot of people were like obsessed. And then a lot of people came in that we don't even know who had like a lot of issues. Um, But the number one comment, Gaylord the third said, okay, not in a sexual way, but can we please have a behind the scenes? Not anything explicit, just like an explanation or something, because this is actually really interesting. Totally. So my background is in music production. Mm -hmm. Um, I was always a sound nerd. And that was very much my intro into making music in general. So cool. I was in college and had my own journey of unlearning a lot of things from my own lack of sex ed. Mm-hmm. And I've heard I heard of this, you know, tagline sex tech as an industry. And it was still a pretty new term. And yeah. literally was just like looking uh, at Facebook pages or like community pages that people who people who were in sex tech or had jobs in that 
industry mm-hmm. and asking people to get coffee literally for no other reason than to just help my vocabulary and trying to learn just how to, to talk learn more. yeah yeah just to talk more comfortably about these things just like it was like if this can be more like in my peer-to-peer conversations it'll mm-hmm. better my ability to understand these things mm-hmm. um and so I stumbled across this company, Lioness, and Liz. Who I knew it. Started Lioness. Yeah, we had Anna on this podcast. And oh, she's amazing! Just like one of my favorite people in the. Yeah, the, when I saw your video, I was like, I know where that came from. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Anna's so great, and Liz was amazing, and. I was like, you know, in the process of just figuring out weird ways to make music and to craft sound design that was more specific to my own process and kind of stumbled across their Bluetooth vibrator and reached out and was like, I I think I can hack your tech. And they Mm. were like, yeah, go ahead. If you can figure it out, like, let us know. And then I I did. So masturbating with the lioness toy and then using the waveform created by the Bluetooth to make sound. Yeah. So since then, that was, I mean, now probably five, six years ago. Um, It's now just become like a super intrinsic part of my process. I treat it as another instrument. Uh, The Bluetooth vibrator has two internal sensors. So Mm -hmm. it is tracking contractions over time that gets delivered to you through the Bluetooth app. And I basically just take contractions over time and change the parameters to amplitude over time, which is how you generate sound. And then from there, I can craft whatever kinds of sounds that I want. Um, But it really started from like me just being a sound nerd, um, parallel to this journey of being a more sex positive person. And now it's kind of my little little secret Trojan horse. So I'm glad that people responded on the post on your guys' page yeah. with animosity because that's also the point. Like that's definitely also the point. For well, that was what was it. so interesting is so many people were like, I don't want to hear someone's orgasm and like this is disgusting or whatever. And I was like, first of all, there there's no actual moaning or anything going on. Like she says well, that was <laughs> it's the wave form. when I was looking at the comments, people were like, I don't want to hear someone's like heavy breathing shit. This is so dirty and nasty. And it's so that stuff is so interesting to me and I love when people comment things like that because that's not what it is Mm -hmm. (laughs) like the actual orgasm in that song is a bass line and a synth part so you would have no idea that it's orgasm music unless I told you which is kind of my favorite part and so people kind of show their ass without knowing when they react to it and there is so much of that in music already like Donna Summer has that song I feel love which is about an orgasm but again you wouldn't know unless you looked into it it's like a little Easter egg. Totally. Totally. Um, but then on the other hand, there are many songs where there's actual moaning and talking explicitly about sex. And like someone wrote genuine question that I mean no harm with, but why are female musicians so obsessed with their genitalia? Like, I know you got more to be singing, rapping about than that. I don't even mind stuff that people do sing about that kind of stuff. But I feel like there's just an incredibly blatant pattern for that stuff when it comes to females. And I don't know why. Someone said, I think it has to do with the fact that women have been shamed for years for their sexuality. Most people don't even know the anatomy of a vulva. And women even shame other women for being remotely sexual. Sex for some women equals power and self-acceptance. I hope this made sense. And then this person said, men talk about their dicks 24-7 and use them in art and expression a ton as well. You can go anywhere without seeing some dick drawn somewhere. So much art interpretation is about phalli and phallic forms as well. But when female sexual organs are concerned, people get suspicious. Well, so I I went to art school, which was like its own whole thing. And I had like a, a thesis where you like present what you do and mm-hmm. a panel of whatever, like industry professionals give you feedback. And the biggest thing that I got told <clears throat> by multiple people is they were like, you know, we get it and it's cool and, it, you know, it's a, it's fun, but it just feels too much like a gimmick. Like what, you're just going to make music about sex forever? Like yeah. that's not sustainable. And how that was so funny because I'm like, well, one, if you had any idea and listened to anything that I've said, that's so not what I'm making music about at all. Mm-hmm. It has it's so much more nuance than that. And two... I can list like 45 men off the top of my head that have only ever made music about sex forever yeah. and have a pretty sustainable long career. <laughs> um, somebody wrote, if you've ever listened to Guns N' Roses' Rocket Queen, like there's an actual woman's orgasm on that. And it the, the backstory is crazy. Like yeah. she was like someone else's in the band's girlfriend and like Axel was fucking her. And it's like way more sinister than like just you 
having a little masturbation session, plugging in your lioness, then plugging in that into the computer and using like a wave. 100%. Apparently Axel recorded 30 minutes worth of material with that woman to get it like for the song. So it was like a lot that went into. I I was going to say, right. But like also I think it's more digestible again when it's like, like the man using the woman's orgasm instead of her using it herself. Well, I think that's also like so much a part of kind of for me, like the performance art of it, of like, I've been taught my whole life that an orgasm is something I don't own. It's something I perform for other people, whether Mm -hmm. that's through media or relationships with real people or whatever else. So the idea of me not only, you know, genuinely sourcing it myself, but then also having all the autonomy over it, Mm -hmm. people's response to that, once again, kind of proves the point of why I think it's like really necessary. Totally. There's songs about guys being like, she's 16 and she's mine. And like, nobody had a problem with that. They didn't have a problem with Christina Aguilera singing. You've got to rub me the right way as a child because she didn't write that music. And it's like, was kind of thrust upon her. And then when Britney Spears come out with, comes out with touch of my hand, everyone's like, yuck. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) There was an analysis of popular music from the 60s to 2008, and it reveals that men sing about both romantic love and sex more often than women. So interesting. Well, it's also like a double-edged sword, right? Because I've also Mm -hmm. been told very often of like, pick one, like either you're like an artist and like a hot girl and you run around on a stage or you're an activist with a message, like pick one. It's too confusing when it's both. Yeah. Which I think is so funny. And I, I just think in general, like just femme people in entertainment get told like pick a box it's like we either respect you or we want to fuck you pick Mm -hmm. one and if you dance in between the two which is like just the reality of women having multi-dimensions to themselves and being real people Mm -hmm. um you're punished in some way and penalized in some way or branded with like making a statement for just kind of like existing in your reality i mean harry styles he's i think very multifaceted he sings about watermelon sugar which is literally (laughs) about eating box and he holds his little pride fans like he's an act. He's both. And like, totally. we love it. He's just allowed to be a right. little bit more. Yeah. A hundred percent. So do you remember your first orgasm ever in life? Yeah, I had, a, okay. I feel like a backwards, a backwards experience to most of the women in my life where mm-hmm. I, the first time that I ever came was like on accident. Like I didn't know what that really was. Oh, it was with my high school boyfriend. Okay. Which was so not like intentional. Like he wasn't like quick with it. It was like totally (laughs) an accident. Um, And it was kind of just like a trial and error. Like I think we were just like messing around and this happened. And I was like, whoa, that's so crazy. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that was like a thing that's supposed to happen. Um, And I was so young. Like I was, I think I, I was like 14 at that point and had like a long high school relationship with this person and then broke up and did not have another orgasm with a partner. Mm. for like you know six years after yeah. that and so I feel like I almost had this backwards ideology of like that was also a super toxic like young emotionally abusive relationship that I just wasn't like I wish I hadn't had to have been in so it also mm-hmm. was a lot of reverse like learning of this person is not like the only special person in the world for right. me like which is and, how it feels especially which is when how they, it feels yeah Especially when, like, you don't learn. Like, I thought it was happenstance, you know? Like, I thought it was, like, mm-hmm. by luck. Um, and I still didn't or really have... Or something special about him. Totally. I didn't really have, too, yeah. like, the terminology to even explain, like, what an orgasm was. Um, and my I went to public school in a pretty small town in Pennsylvania, and we did not have, like, a holistic sex ed program at all. So I was also just kind of flying bu- blind in that regard. And... I also in high school was like, I think I'm also really attracted to women, which was also so scary because there was no mm-hmm. at least mainstream media for me to consume of like, what do you even do with that? <laughs> yeah. <was> like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> so I feel like for me, the most of my journey then after that, you know, relationship as like a, a young adult was having horrible sexual encounters and kind of just mm-hmm. like wishing to go back in time of like, why did I have this? super special thing only happened to me with this really unspecial person. Mm. Um, And it really wasn't until I started like putting people in my peer group who had more knowledge and comfortability and talking about those things that I started to really understand like, oh, this is something that I can 
learn within myself and then something that I can also demand as a communication barrier to entry in anyone that I'm having an intimate relationship with. Yeah, I was going to ask because you were so brave to just reach out to people in sex tech like did mm. you first reach out to people in your life that you were like hey is anybody else coming regularly or you know what I mean no I was not the friend that talked about any of this and mm -hmm. like my friend groups weren't super super open about it either now that is very different but no I it was not that at all I honestly was more curious about asking people what their parents felt about their jobs I was like, do oh. your parents know what you do for a living? Like people that was working like either in sex ed reform or for vibrator companies or okay, okay. pleasure podcasts or whatever else. And so yeah. it was more so like getting coffee with people. One, just curious about what they did. And then like, how do you explain that to your family? Which was like showing my deep rooted childhood trauma. Right. Okay. I was like, because you were trying to work out how you would explain it to yours. Yeah. My family was, yeah. they're not artistic people at all. They're still like very confused about what I do. Um, and I think I had like such a hunch of, I wanted to do something in a front facing capacity in music. So that in and of itself was scary. And so I was like, oh, if I can ask these people how they broke it to their loved ones, they're doing something way, way more raunchy mm -hmm. than I am. And it just mm -hmm. so happened that we ended up way more aligned than I thought we would be. Um, but just from those conversations, like just being around more people who were comfortable talking about masturbation, comfortable talking about their bodies and comfortable talking about sex with people in general, that would just mm -hmm. come out in the conversations naturally. Um, and I think that I definitely s decided to make music with a vibrator way before my personal spirit had cut up with the comfortability of that. So it was kind of like a practice for me of once I released yeah. music, I had to talk about it. I had no other yeah. option. Um, yeah, because you liked the waveforms that much. Yeah. <laughs> That's so interesting. So was that your first foray into sex toys? That was very much my first intro. Okay. okay. Yeah, very much my first intro. Um, oh, cool. And then I was like, what have I been doing? So the lioness <laughs> was your first toy? Yeah. Wow. Oh my God, yeah. that's so cute. I know it's like, it's really special. Like they feel like mama bear to me in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also just worth noting that like, you know, having now had multiple conversations with other like tech adjacent spaces, women in sex tech are so down. Like Anna and Liz were so mm -hmm. and have been just so open to let me do like whatever I want, any weird ideas I have. They're like, let us know how we can help. And I think that's also been super helpful. Like I've just been really surrounded by women in tech spaces mm -hmm. and in sex positive spaces that are like, yeah, shoot spaghetti at the wall. Like the worst thing that happens is we can't figure it out. Totally. So were you ever masturbating manually and successfully? Yeah, I feel like after okay. my after my first boyfriend, I was like, which was also just so much like deep rooted Catholic guilt, right? Mm -hmm. After my first boyfriend, I was like craving this. So I was like, that felt great and made me feel good. And now I don't have it with anyone else. And I something must be wrong with me or wrong with this relationship. And uh, a second boyfriend that I had was super religious. And he, mm -hmm. he was super like indoctrinated <laughs> in all of that bullshit. So he was very weird about like, even us having sex was like, like immediately afterwards he would take a shower kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I was like a little bit too young to understand what that was. Um, and he was really weird about masturbating and would like say things that I feel like made me feel like it was something I had to hide or something that I right. additionally couldn't ask for in any kind of communication. So yeah, I feel like it was like six years of like, manual DJing before I figured out like there are so many things that DJing. make this easier <laughs> <The fuck? laughs> though an acoustic set is nice sometimes yes, yes. I like to have yeah. it stripped down yeah and now it's like the joke with my friends is like if I go out and I'm like trying to have a night night like if I'm like I'm gonna have a one night stand tonight or if I think that that's gonna happen anyways like I always have a bullet in my bag that's amazing like now I, I don't think I've had sex without a vibrator in like oh my god years yeah, it's like no, a pre-rack. Love that. Yeah, you like have a backpack. Yeah. Yeah. Do you ever make music with other types of vibrators, like with like the vibration that they make? So I just actually a few months ago started this with contact mics. Okay. Um, with the with various vibration patterns from 
other vibrators that I can then make into mostly base patterns. So nice. That's still like in the lab. <laughs> oh my God. But it's been really fun. It's like the world is my oyster a little bit. Yeah, I was going to say. And now you have suction toys too that make completely like I would love to hear a suck toy. Totally. Oh my God. I think it totally. would be like Pavlov's dog for a lot of people. They would hear it and just <laughs> yeah. like start like busting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Amazing. How has the response been like versus like from this versus other music that you were making before so the first music i ever ever put out was orgasm music so i kind of okay great didn't, didn't have anything to juxtapose it with um mm -hmm. but it was always very interesting like i i have a very academic background um and always kind of led with that when explaining it to people and now i teach at nyu mm -hmm. which is where i went to school and it's, it is just very interesting how, again, like I was saying earlier, women are very placed into like, we either respect you or we want to fuck you. Pick one. Madonna whore. A hundred percent. And I think yeah. that I end up straddling the in-between of that for a lot of people and kind of force them to confront it in real time. So mm -hmm. even like with students, right, where I have like a bunch of immature boys in my classroom, who like want to try something or want to like whisper something or whatever. And they, they like, you know, know what my Instagram is or whatever else. Like mm -hmm. immediately, I'm also the professor. And I'm also the person they have to respect in the room. Things like that are like, even with professors of like, when I was a student who can think one thing about me when it's like a showcase and they're like watching me do my thing versus like when I'm in the boardroom, like pitching what I'm making or pitching a project and like know my shit about it. Um, they have to toggle between their own misconceptions of placing women in, in a really defined box. So I feel like for me personally, school is very helpful because it gave me the academic backing I needed to circumvent that narrative that I think totally. a lot of women don't, don't get the opportunity to do. Yeah. Um, and I just want to go back to um, religious upbringing because you mentioned that and I didn't realize until we posted and a bunch of people got really mad about it that there was an upside down cross behind you. There it the is. Video. And there it is. <laughs> so I thought a lot of people, that's maybe what offended them first. And then they saw sex had to do with it and they got even more mad. Yeah. I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. My grandparents are Byzantine Catholic, which is like Catholic on speed, you know? Mm -hmm. and I did the whole thing. Like I did catechism and my brothers went to all boys Catholic school and whatever else. So it was very much like ingrained in me. And the most interesting thing for me was as a kid, like reading a lot of these stories, I would, I would see the point in the stories. Like one of my favorite stories in the Bible is when this woman who's been accused of adultery is about to get stoned. Mm -hmm. And Jesus like walks in and in the painful says, way, not the fun way. No, in a super <laughs> in a super fucking painful way. Yeah. And so all these men are there ready to stone her for her sins. And Jesus walks in and he's like, you know, if any of you have never sinned, you can throw the first stone. And then no one throws yeah. a stone. Yeah. And as a kid, I remember reading that as like, oh, this rocks. Like <laughs> we're supposed that to love good. everyone. Like this is super welcoming. Uh, this is so beautiful. Don't judge anyone for their lifestyle kind of thing. Like, yeah, I thought I understood and therefore myself was really religious for a long time because I thought that was the message. And then as I started to understand Catholicism's views in a cultural, you know, present day stance, right. I would get confused and I would ask like my catechism teacher, other people, I was like, wait, I don't understand. Why does this story say this? But then gay people aren't allowed to get married or why does this mm -hmm. story say this but you can't have sex like there were so many questions I had that didn't make sense and the response I would always get was like because because that's what it says because right which is now my biggest red flag as an adult like if someone ever says because to a question red flag S -S -S -S. and they don't have the answer yeah they, like s-o-s-o-s -S -S. and that has yeah. been my relationship with religion so I think people think that I have a way more like blasphemous view which is actually not true I find a lot of beauty in these stories and their stories that I was raised on, I mm -hmm. find problem with the ways that they've been co-opted since for an alternate agenda than what I believe was intended. A million percent. And I think, again, it's a reading comprehension issue. The same way that people were like, 
I don't want to hear these moans, even though you stated there's no moans in this. They saw orgasm, their brain went somewhere. It is the same way that like the Bible has been misinterpreted. Totally. And we have an entire episode on this. Um, it's called Two Christians. I think it's season two. Yeah, I think it's season two. Yeah. Um, and it's just about how like a lot of the Bible has been uh, misread or misinterpreted or used, like, like you said, for a different agenda than it was initially intended for. Yeah. And my middle name is Mary and I have her on my little tattoo oh my on my arm, my girl. And yeah. I have this theory of like, which is how I feel like I have interpreted being sexualized as a young girl and sexualized now as an adult woman with a lot of autonomy in what I do mm -hmm. is whether you're a Catholic or Christian or not, you have been penetrated by the ideology of the Virgin Mother, right? Yeah. A woman who is pure but childbearing. Mm -hmm. And what a convenient story because that is not possible in real life. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Okay, wait. Some of you might be thinking, what about that virgin shark that just had a baby? Um, that hadn't happened on this episode yet. And also, I just want to clear that up, what, what that is. So, an Italian shark had a virgin birth, quote-unquote, after 10 years in an all-female shark tank. And this is an article from Live Science. A shark's rare virgin birth in an Italian aquarium may be the first of its kind, scientists say. The female baby smooth hound shark, known as Espera, or Hope in Maltese, was recently born at the Calicet Gonon Aquarium in Sardinia to a mother that has spent the last decade sharing a tank with only other females and no males. This rare phenomenon, known as parthenogenesis, is a result of females' ability to self-fertilize their own eggs in extreme scenarios. Parthenogenesis has been observed in more than 80 vertebrate species, including sharks, fish, and reptiles. But this may be the first documented occurrence in a smooth hound shark, according to Newsweek. So pathenogenesis may occur infrequently, but it happens in many types of sharks. About 15 species of sharks and rays are known to do this, but it is likely that most species can probably do it, he added. Which has me thinking, just thinking, <laughs> apparently it is essentially a form of inbreeding as the genetic diversity of the offspring is greatly reduced. So they might have a reduced chance of survival. There's a high rate of embryonic failure amongst offspring, but when they do survive, many have normal lives and some can even reproduce. That's pretty cool. And maybe... Like that would be an even cooler story if it was like actually Mary, she impregnated herself. Ooh, that's very empowering. Anyway. And so I feel as though questions that I always had as a kid, which I was confused by is like after a woman became a mom, if she came to church with too much makeup on, the town would talk about her. Or if she had a new boyfriend, the town would talk about her. Or like, you know, any adjacency to a woman having sex after she's already had children was disgusting. And I was confused. I was like, well, how do you think she had a baby? Like, mm -hmm. I'm so confused. She had to like have sex to have a baby. But now if she talks about sex, she's bad. Like as a kid, it made no sense to me. And I think that that concept of, you know, a, a childbearing virgin is very much what I see in my interactions with men in entertainment, right? It's like, you, we want you to be pure and sacred and respectful and everything mm -hmm. else while also do your job that is intended for you. And mm -hmm. if you break out of any of those molds, you're a problem. And I think that that happens for me a lot where like I have, I mean, in my apartment, I have a, a <laughs> I have a church pew and a holy water fountain and all of this religious iconography everywhere. Mm -hmm. And that's my own version of, of healing this trauma for myself. Um, yeah. But people find it very disrespectful. You recontextualize it for yourself. Right. And that's how I see it. And I see it as healing and I see it as like my own ways of worship. But I think because it doesn't fit into the exact specific mold under modesty and purity and everything else, I'm immediately casted as like quite satanic. And I think that that's mm. part of that's part of the issue. And like the show, I throw these shows, Bloody Mary and my community people like are so loving and mm. I'm surrounded by such a close knit group of super uplifting, deeply spiritual people who would like run in front of a car for me. Um, and we invest in one another as creatives. We are there for each other as friends. We, you know, 
shelter each other when we're in need of it. And yeah. that to me is like a congregation. Like that is what church was supposed to be. And I just think that it's interesting, the hypocrisy that I get told of like how antichrist we are when in reality, I feel like we're doing all the things that if that person were alive today, he'd be like, kudos. <laughs> totally. I also just, I had the thought when you said that Mary is your middle name. And then we're talking about the Virgin Mary. Yeah. And then there's also Mary Magdalene. And yes. I remember growing up and I'm Jewish. So I never thought I understood Christianity because I was like, well, of course I don't understand it. I'm not Christian. Mm. Um, and I would always get confused. I'd be like, wait, which Mary? Like there's two. And now I'm like, oh my God, is that where the Madonna whore complex came from? Is like, there's one that's the virgin and one that's literally a sex worker. And they're both named Mary. It's so interesting because there are all of these stories about both Marys consoling each other when he is crucified. Mm -hmm. And there are stories about Mary Magdalene actually being like his wife and actually being his lover and them having a child together. And there's all these other stories that people have discounted. And, you know, she was like one of the first doctors, which has mm -hmm. then gotten spun into. That. Yeah, she was like a, a medicinal healer. Um, but Mary Magdalene got spun into like she was just like the whore of the Bible and was kind of like deduced to that in a way. And I think it also plays so much into like weird relationships with mothers and their sons of like their sons can do no wrong. Any mm -hmm. woman that comes in between a mother and their son is a whore or is like trying to steal the limelight or has bad intentions. Like all of it is so deep rooted which is why I find it important to talk about because it affects everyone, even if you have no idea about these stories and weren't raised in this religion. Like, mm -hmm. it's so pervasive in our cultural beliefs now anyways. Um, but yeah, I, I feel a very, very deep connection to the Marys in like a super meta way. <laughs> yeah, no, and even just like, as you said, they were comforting each other. Like, it does serve the patriarchy that's rewriting it to be like, no, actually they didn't like each other and pit them against each other when 100%. like so much of what we require is community with each other yeah book rec for anyone if you want to have your brain blown the mm -hmm. magdalene manuscript is one of my favorite books and it is basically it tells you know this potential alternate story of mary magdalene being jesus's lover and i think it's really lovely and then cool. another book is called the book of eve which talks about if you know, the story of Adam and Eve was also flipped on its head. And they're just two alternate perspectives that I think if this is something that you like struggle with or Catholic guilt is something that also, you know, pulses deep in your blood. <laughs> They've been yeah. super, super fun hits for me. <laughs> I saw a thing about how like Eve is blamed for original sin, but like she was deceived and Adam wasn't. And so really it's his fault. Something There's like so that. much new, so much nuance that I could like quite literally talk about all day, which again is the point of like it gets deduced to people commenting on a video like you have an up down upside down cross, fuck you, right? And Instead what does of, it mean to you the upside down cross? Then I think for me, all of this is like my own recontextualization. Like mm -hmm. I really do think that the intention was quite pure and beautiful, and I think it's been horrifically co opted. So, you know, me interpreting it the way that I feel like it actually is at face value mm -hmm. is funny because I get told like you're not allowed to interpret when I actually think that everyone else who is pushing a, a super devout Catholic agenda has completely interpreted it for their own their own gain anyways it's totally. just when I do it it's not as not as welcome <laughs> mm -hmm. so you said uh, I'm assuming you've told your parents no since you haven't told them? No. Is that something that you want to approach with them or are you just keeping it for yourself for a bit? I don't think it's a want or not want. I think it's an inevitable that I'm just like, I guess we'll find out when that happens kind of thing. Um, my dad years ago, like followed my school on Twitter and they reposted an article about me and my dad saw it. And like we were having a fight one night and it like kind of slipped out, mm. but we, he never brought it up with me again. And so I, th I think my parents at this point, like, they're not stupid like they're smart people they've yeah. been to my apartment it's like you know i have like a pew with like a demonic rabbit lady with three boobs and a butt plug in her like they're definitely not <laughs> dumb you know what yeah. i mean yeah um, amazing but i think i think they're kind of like don't ask don't tell and i think until it gets to a point where they need to be privy i'll grant mm -hmm. them 
mm-hmm. that out of respect, but like, they don't fall. My family members don't follow me on the internet anywhere. I'm super particular about like not using my first or last name and things, mm-hmm. which was funny when I was like first starting. And it's also funny now because like I'm such a tiny presence where I'm like, don't put my last name in there. They're like, oh, that's so dramatic. And I'm like, no, it's it's actually not dramatic. It's like, I don't want, I have spent so much time learning how to talk about these things, cultivating my opinions on these things and my Mm -hmm. like talking points. My parents have not and they should not be like given Mm -hmm. that responsibility. So like if someone Googles me and my dad comes up and someone at work asks my dad, he should not have to explain what I'm doing and I would never put that on him. And so and I think that also as I'm getting older, I'm learning like in me wanting to have the respect to do what I do. It means that, you know, I also respect their lack of understanding for the time mm-hmm. being as long as I'm not judged for what I'm doing um like I have a rule with some of my aunts <laughs> where I'm like you're allowed to follow me on the internet but you're mm-hmm. not allowed to say anything about it and if totally. you feel the need to say something about it you should not follow me yeah mm-hmm. so most of them do not <laughs> but yeah like that's kind of our respect layer and I think that every child doing something like pervasive has to find that own boundary with their own parents. And I think that mine is probably a little bit harder for them. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm working in that in real time, but it it is very funny because they have no idea what's going on. But sometimes you just need your own space to figure out what's going on before you can come back and explain it. Yeah. And you don't make art for your parents. And realistically, they're not your yeah. target demo ever. So for me, Never. it's actually, it's been, it's been helpful because I'm like, I feel uninhibited versus some of my friends who, you know, their parents are super integral, which I think is so beautiful. There adds another layer of anxiety of like, fuck, are they going to like it? And I'm like, I don't even have to worry about that, which is kind of freeing. Mm-hmm. So we were just talking about, um, misinterpretations of the Bible and it's pride. So we would be remiss to talk about the biggest one, which is basically like, I think the line is like, a man should not lie with a boy the way he lies with his wife or whatever. And then it got um, mistaken for lie with another man. But really, it was like, don't be a pedophile. And look how that turned out. (laughs) Yeah. And now look at the church. That's the thing is like, there's a lot of great church people that are not pedophiles. And it, it makes everybody seem bad when you don't hold the bad ones accountable. Well, I think I I have a more nuanced perspective on this because one of the first dioceses that like went down and uncovering Mm -hmm. all these scandals was the diocese that taught my parents in their Catholic school. No. My parents knew a lot of the priests who were named, um, (gasps) which was very interesting. And on top of that, I have um, multiple gay aunts. Uh And I have a pretty big family. And again, Mm -hmm. my grandmother was super Byzantine Catholic. And she was kind of faced with this decision of like, do I accept my kids or do I go by what my faith says? And she chose to, you know, accept her kids with open arms. And my grandmother is like such an amazing, amazing woman and is so open to changing her viewpoints and her understanding and is learning so much as like an 80-year-old woman. She's so Mm -hmm. open to new ideas that have not yet been presented to her. But with that being said there are multiple people at her church that have totally shunned her, like won't sit by her or not her friends Mm -hmm. anymore, whatever else. And so I think I have a a more extremist view on my frustrations of that hypocrisy Um, because I feel as though when you uplift a infrastructure that makes Mm -hmm. it so that like, it's not a coincidence that priests are constantly being found guilty of molesting children. Mm -hmm. When you tell human beings that are innately sexual by nature to abstain, 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 and then have them only be around young, you know, impressionable Mm -hmm. boys, like two plus two equals four. Right. And so it's like we, as a, as a congregation, as a religion, as a collective are doing a disservice to putting people in these susceptible positions as, as like, you know, altar boys as well, Mm. putting them in these really susceptible positions and then scratching our heads and saying, oh, it's a bad apple. Yeah. And it's like, this is designed for this it's to like happen. The system is bad and it's designed for it to rot. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, yeah, I have very, you know, fascinating conversations with a lot of people in my life who are very religious on that concept. But I just feel like, you know, I was just watching the Hulu documentary about Hillsong, the like mega church. Mm-hmm. 
And the guy who was like the pastor who cheated on his wife, it's like this big scandal is talking and he was like, you know, I was a sex addict. And I was like, maybe you weren't a sex addict. Maybe you just weren't meant to only have sex with one person your yeah. entire adult life. And because yeah. that's all you preached about not having sex with anyone until you married them. Now you're like a normal human being. That's like, oh shit. You know, I was repressing myself. And then, yeah. It, yeah. So it's a little dicey there for me. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely anybody who is upholding that same system. Or if somebody is told that something is going on, like, and doesn't report the person. Again, I don't really know... I don't have my own church or anything, but like I've heard that there are pastors that can have sex and there are preachers that can have wives. Yeah, it's hard because there's so much, like there really is so many people trying really, really, really hard to change the way that Catholicism and Christianity and church in general has like is modernized in a mm -hmm. more modern context. And I think there's so many well-intentioned people, obviously a part of that. And most of the people that are upholding these structures are not doing it knowingly or malintentedly. Like, mm -hmm. they don't even realize. I just think sometimes it's very hard to, which is like my own extremist versions of things, but like, I'm such a burn it all down person that yeah. I and think then it's build just it hard. back up yeah. <laughs> in a different way. We always have this joke with like my, my team members of friends who were like, what if we like are whores? Like, what if we're not like whores that are like, you know, going to be saved by Christ to not be whores? What if we like accept that we want to live a life of whoredom? Then like, <laughs> what would that guy have in store for us? Like, mm -hmm. we exist, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm reading Robin's list right now that she said, a brief history of female horniness. I love. <laughs> and here's a bunch of songs from women. Sex With Me by Rihanna. Which Love. I remember, I was like, yes, go That off. was my and alarm like, for a long time. Really? Yeah, which actually kind of sucks now because whenever I hear it, I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, my Neck, My Back by Classic. Kia. Classic. I remember when this came out being like, how could she? Interesting. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so funny. I'm like, you're what? And you're <laughs> crack? <laughs> <laughs> Not like, the crack. No. Yeah. No one will ever want to date you if you start singing about your pussy and your crack. That's so funny. I just saw Janet Jackson um, mm -hmm. on tour, which is oh my crazy. God. She's 57 years old. Yeah. And slaying. Absolutely slaying. And yeah, it launched us. And, and Lil' Kim was opening. And it launched me and my friends into like this big discussion of like, once things become nostalgic, you forget how pervasive they were. Like Janet yeah. was, Janet OG tours were crazy, mm -hmm. like so crazy. And now like enough of that shock value has worn off that people can really like cement her as such an icon and the legend that she is. But right, I think it's easy to forget, like with so many like icons and entertainment, people were super mad before everyone collectively was like, all right, yeah, that was cool. <laughs> I mean, people were mad at WAP. Totally. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Totally. Yeah. People are always going to be mad. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned Lil' Kim. How many licks? Totally. <laughs> um, Bubbly by Colby Calais. I don't know if anybody realizes this, but it starts in my toes and then I crinkle it's my nose. It's about a full body orgasm. I did not know that. Yeah. I remember so singing it when I was like six. Emily and I were yeah. in the car and I was like singing it. And then like as I got older, I was like, there's something more to this song. <laughs> Wow, I did not know that. See, what a gorgeous Trojan horse. So fun. Love that. Alternatively, there was also that song, it's not about orgasms, but next, when it was like, baby, when we're grinding, I get so excited, and it's talking about his boner. Oh. Yeah, like, I feel a little poke, poke coming through on you. Through. Yeah. <laughs> I remember listening to that and going, he couldn't be talking about his boner. <laughs> Why does that give me like flashbacks to like a seventh grade dance when you're like Literally. hiding from the teacher on the ladder and like a boy's kind of poking at you and you're like, what's in your pants, Jack? It was, <laughs> but also they would play that song. Totally. And I would be like, how is he not in jail for these lyrics? <laughs> 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 oh, it's so good. 
And then we also have a list of songs that also sample sex. Aphex Twin, Window Liquor. Oh, love. Um, Disclosure, What's in Your Head. I did not know that one. Uh, Donna McGee, Make It Last Forever. I don't know how all these ones feature them, but. I skipped, I did skip to the four minute mark, like the article suggested, and it's just like intense moaning. Like it sounds like they've got like wow. the moans in it. And it's like they use the moans to build anticipation in the song. Interesting. Wow. There's quite um, a few of them that'll do that, that they use the the music and then they'll like get the moans getting or well, the breathing will intensify like in the background and it's so like you don't really pick up on it, but the music's adding to it. There's another one somewhere here that has it's like eight minutes long or something and it ends in a like guitar solo that's like the release. So the whole thing like emulates what an orgasm would be like. I'll see if I can find which one it was. Wow. It was mad. While you're finding that, I just want to go back to some of these comments that we got. <laughs> uh, I haven't checked in a minute, so I might not be. Oh, I've deleted in. them all. Like, <laughs> they don't serve me. And these cl- people are clearly not here to, like, learn anything. And they yeah, just, like, are really stupid. Um, this person said, clearly she didn't produce the song, LOL. Love. That is one of my favorite ones to get, for sure. Like why <laughs> i also get so many random dms from like beat making boys that are like yo can i send you a beat or whatever would love to produce for you and i will super respectfully be like oh my gosh like thanks so much that's so kind i actually produce for myself so i'm not super looking for that right now but thank you and mm-hmm. like immediately it's like a it's like such a fuck you energy like oh like you think like like come on like mine would be so much yeah. better or like you know, how dare you? Or like, that's not real. And I think it's just so, it's so deep rooted. And like, we just don't view women as being like the brains behind the operation ever. No brains, all pussy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what they think. No, I, I had a similar experience and I do often with comedy. Like I'll have mm. guys come up to me and be like, oh, like, here's a joke. Now don't steal this. And I'm like, or they'll like be like, hey, I have a great joke for you. And I'm like, actually, I like write my own shit. Like, and also I would never steal that ha- incredibly hack thing you just yeah. said. To <laughs> it's me. also probably so bad. My favorite thing, I think it was Nikki Glazer. She was said, um, women will tell men things they think that they will find funny. Mm-hmm. And men will just tell everyone things they find funny. Yeah. I see that in TikToks even, right? Like when I go to send like a guy friend a TikTok, I will also think like, this is something they would think is funny. Yes. And they will I send tailor, me things. Everybody has their own tailored feed from me. Yes. And I will get sent things from my guy friends. I'm like, that was the dumbest fucking thing ever. And they're like, whoa, we were like yes. cracking up. And I'm like, yes. Oh my and I'm God, sure don't. you deal with this so much in the comedy world, but I feel like, you know, being again someone who is academically backed and smart and like knows my shit Mm -hmm. the second that like a dude says something which happens to me all the time like especially in music like Mm -hmm. a boy says something that's like hyper sexualizing me or one of my dancers or something else like something kind of out of pocket and I will like respond they're like oh shit like I thought you were cool like now like fuck you know and it's so frustrating how unless I just fully cater to your comfort and your Mm -hmm. like ego stroke, I'm like the bad guy, but you've not come, you've not catered to any of my comforts or ego this whole interaction. Yeah, no. And, but that being said, we had so many great guys and non women in the comments fighting for you too. Like, I highly recommend everybody go through that thread because it's just like wonderful. (laughs) Yeah. Like, now I, that I've ousted most of the other people. I also think there's something to be said too. Cause I, again, I think my two biggest like misconceptions from how sometimes I present the art that I make on the internet is that like I am, I think religious is blasphemy and I hate men. And neither mm-hmm. of those things are true. And like mm-hmm. some of my favorite people to make stuff with happen to be men. And some of my favorite people to spend time with happen to be men. And I think that mm-hmm. the difference is like they're just men that like don't allow their peers or themselves to fall below the bar. Like they treat me completely as an equal. They, you know, see me for all of my worth. They yeah. you know, make sure that everyone else in the room respects me. And if anyone doesn't, they're the first people to speak up about it and take it as like their responsibility. 
Yeah. No, whenever I even just like say men, like I, I'm not even thinking about the men that don't fit into that category. I'm thinking about yeah. the culture of men. Yeah. And this is something that John Fugel saying, uh, who did that two Christians episode mentioned, and we've mentioned a lot is that like a lot of toxic, uh, patriarchal values end up doing really bad shit for men that d- don't align with that stuff. hundred percent. Yeah, like I was just doing a podcast talking about sex and, you know, we got into this conversation about how communicating about pleasure is so stigmatized and it also harms men. Like part of the reason why I've had a Mm -hmm. hard time communicating with partners is because it's it's internalized that you did something wrong or like what you're supposed to be good at. You're not good at from a male perspective. Right. Like. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting how these these concepts affect everyone. They're not like some psycho von feminist messaging. Like they're actually for no. everyone's betterment. <laughs> yeah. No. And like that's an interesting thing too is, oh, yeah, we didn't want to speak up because we thought that we couldn't take up space. But also we didn't want to speak up in bed because you thought you'd be, quote unquote, emasculating someone. And I've been just thinking about that word so much that I'm like, what does that mean? Yeah. Like what is emasculate and what is the female equivalent? Yeah. Like I've never had someone do something to me that I'm just like, you've taken away my womanhood by, I don't know. Like this is a weird example, but a guy I know, someone else washed their car and they said, you're trying to emasculate me. (laughs) Sorry. <laughs> and and it was like what? Like how? First of all, that person was just trying to do something nice. Yeah. But also like just like is is your gender that fragile then? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that link to like the grime on your dashboard like so weird. What? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I I can't even think of a thing that would make me be like that effeminated me. Yeah. Unless like somebody like fucked my boyfriend like on top of my bed on top of me. (laughs) But even then I wouldn't be like my womanhood, my gender is gone because of this act. Yeah. You'd be like, I'm just like pretty pissed. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's like you disrespected me. Yeah. But that's also the the real thing. Yeah. People conflate disrespect with like what I think that I am owed in the perception of me based on what I am told that I am worth. And what is worthy of respect? Manhood. So that's yeah. what they're saying. Instead of like, it's like you emasculated me. It's like, no, you disrespected me as a man. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas like, oh, you disrespected me as a woman. Oh, we're used to that. Yeah. That's like, that's like Tuesday. <laughs> that's Tuesday. Um, yeah. Actually, this comment said, I despise women in STEM. All of your 3D print requests with TPU are banned. None of you are free of sin. Wait, iconic. That I feel like I need to frame (laughs) in my apartment. That is a little bit poetic to me. Wow. I'll send you this screenshot because I deleted it. Yeah, wow. Um, Please send that to me. um, Okay, so how often are you A, masturbating to make music and B, just masturbating for pleasure now? I don't ever masturbate to make music. I feel like I just masturbate for pleasure and then happen to use the data. Because it's hooked up. Because it's already hooked up. Something that I try to be very careful of, which I feel like I I get a response to this a lot whenever I post about sex tech things in general, is that like sex tech is dehumanizing human sexuality or making us sterile or robotic or insular. And that's so not true. And Mm -hmm. every advancement in sex tech that I've been privy to or had like the pleasure of interacting with has only, only benefited my real life human interactions. So I try very Mm -hmm. hard to maintain that whenever I masturbate, it's for my own relationship with myself. It's for my own self-pleasure. And then I just happen to be able to use that data in other ways, mostly just so I can refute those claims when people say like it just makes you like robotic and I'm like actually no it it makes me like a way more 
holistic, comfortable human being. Yeah. No, I think maybe it would feel robotic going into it being like, I'm doing this for work. Totally. Yeah. It would make it less authentic and it might make your orgasms like even like I've been struggling with something recently where I'm trying not to masturbate now out of boredom (laughs) because I've noticed that it doesn't work anymore. Like, and then when I actually am horny, like I've exhausted all of my effort. 100%. Um, So that's just, that's just a new thing about me. Yeah. I had to, um, I also get very excited. Like whenever like emoji baiter, this company just set set me a bunch of toys and they're so, they're so great. Yeah. And I have to like calm myself down because I get so excited and I'm like, I could just do this all day. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. wait, actually no <laughs> like go for a run <laughs> like yeah. do what you need to do with your life but it's such a good problem to have I'm like I'd rather that be my problem than be where I was 10 years ago where I like didn't touch myself out of fear that like the Lord was going to strike me <laughs> totally and do you ever have to like still talk yourself through that that like you're like oh god he's here not with myself anymore, but with okay. other people, I still have to be like, leave the room. This is a two person mm-hmm. party. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. By myself, I'm like game. I have conquered my like patty because of teacher isn't standing over me <laughs> like, mm-hmm. preaching while this mm-hmm. is happening, especially with women I'm going to the eighth rung of the underbelly, you know, so all work right. in progress per se. <laughs> so regarding your queerness how long did it take you to I mean to come out to yourself but then to come out to other people I feel like I never had like a moment my thing was like in high school I was like the funny girl who like Mm -hmm. got drunk and made out with all of her girlfriends and like oh my god you're so silly and then I think I got to college and I was like maybe I'm not silly (laughs) (laughs) maybe that's not what this is um yeah and I think that I had like the Honestly, I had the privilege of going to NYU where like it was way, way less normal to be straight than to not. So totally. I didn't feel like I had to have this like big moment per se. Um, I just kind of like lived my life and then it just became a more like understood part of who I was. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's definitely still something that I really wrestle with with family. There's a lot of family members that don't talk to my gay aunts or don't like touch their children or you know, other super, super insane things. So I am not super out to my family at all. Um, Yeah. Which again, I kind of do for my own safety and my own comfort because I find so much, I I find so much, so much love in my chosen family and my Mm -hmm. artistic creative community that I've kind of been drawing from that well as much as possible to heal the wound of my family members just not being able to accept that part of me. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, a lot of my queer relationships have been the most important for me in unlearning so much of this shit, just even about like bodily pleasure, like, you know, in my, in my queer intimate relationships, like everything is just more communicative by nature usually yeah, than it ever yeah. has been with men. So well, regardless, you're not going to emasculate them. Yeah. It's been really like, no. <laughs> it's been really helpful for me because everyone's kind of like, on the same page it's it mm-hmm. it feels like and everyone's more understanding of like every body is a new body so whatever you think you've mastered with someone else like this mm-hmm. is totally new territory so i try to find like my my really inherent joy in that um and focus on that instead of focusing on how painful it is that like i can't really express that to some of my family members and like just kind of yeah. note it as their loss yeah um, no, I'm sorry that that pain does exist because we did get some comments like that that did be like, oh, you must not have parents and like how could your parents ever be proud of this or whatever? And it's like parents are human beings too and they have their own convictions and they have their own thoughts and it, those thoughts aren't necessarily the right ones. So totally. to just measure everything about like, oh, but like what about your parents? It's like, do you know how many parents exist that are like morons? Oh my God. I think it's so crazy that like you have to do more to get a job, like working a drive through mm. window than you do to birth a child. Like anyone can just do that. That's insane. Or like for gay people, like my aunts who have children now, yeah, like that was a nightmare for them to go through. Like 
all these psychology screenings and whatever else and so much money. And then like straight people are just allowed to birth things with no barrier to entry. That's crazy. (laughs) Birth and raise. That's nuts. That's absolutely nuts. That is out of pocket. And not just allowed, forced sometimes. (laughs) Encouraged. (laughs) Encouraged. Yeah. Um, It's wild. And, and it is nice for babies who are wanted to know like that, like your aunts had to go through crazy processes totally. to get them. And it's like, okay, we knew we were ready. We knew we wanted those kids. Like, that's amazing. Um, are, do you feel wanted by your aunts? Yeah. Good. I, I love my aunts. I think they've been really, honestly, a lot of my family members, I think because of my grandmother, because she's just mm-hmm. gotten with the program because she's had to. Um, yeah. They have grown so much, I think, for the sake of me. For making mm-hmm. me feel accepted and wanted and seen. And mm-hmm. I really appreciate that. And I think I'm trying to get a lot better at understanding like everyone is doing the best they can with the tools they have provided to them. And I yeah. can't expect someone to have a screwdriver if all they have is a wrench. I can just be as appreciative as possible. Like they're they're using the wrench real well. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So You're like try how can I fix a bolt on this nail so that you can <laughs> yeah. work it a little better? Yeah. So I'm 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 figuring it out because again, like as I'm, as I'm doing this, I am healing more and become in my toolbox also gets bigger and what I'm able to totally accept and, and understand in my own boundaries and, and whatnot. So yeah. And I think that they are understanding of, cause like they have really young kids and I had an issue where like one of my baby cousins found my TikTok Mm. And like was like, mommy, <laughs> look at this. And I was like, oh my God. Ah, God. <laughs> yeah. And my aunt called me and and you know, we both agreed, like, we're gonna tell her to block it for now. Like she's young, she doesn't understand these things. Yeah. Whatever. And I think it's cool. Or now my my aunts have kind of come to come to an understanding where they're like, you know, we really hope for our kids and especially for our, like our daughter that she, when she is like 14 or 15, doesn't have to go through the same confusing things you did and can look to you for some mm-hmm. guiding light in that. And that feels really obviously like that's the coolest thing ever to me. Like that's all I want is to be totally. seen as like I'm trying to help. I'm not trying to harm. Yeah. No, and I I also love like whenever I've been asking about coming out stories lately, I've noticed that it's kind of been like there was no big thing. It was like just like a realization and then like living my life or whatever. And yeah. I think we're so accustomed, or at least I am when I first heard coming out stories, it was this big emotional thing and you had to tell a lot of people and it was whatever. And I think your way and the way that other people have said it, it's like, that's kind of the way it should be Mm. is like straight people never have to come out. Totally. You know, it's just kind of like a realization of like, this is who I am. And then like your parents realize at some point too, like you don't have to tell them because they're like, okay, yeah, she's never been interested in boys. If that, you know, like totally. Um, we actually had a really, um, we had a really interesting conversation with my grandmother because one of my little cousins came out as gay mm -hmm. and she was having conversations with my grandma and my grandma was like, you know, well, what if you just don't know? Like, what if you maybe do like boys, but you're so young, you've never been with a boy before. Like maybe you do Mm -hmm. without missing a beat. My little cousin went, well, grandma, have you ever been with a girl? (gasps) And my grandma was like, uh, no. And she was like, well, then how do you know you're not gay? literally my grandma True. was like shit checkmate like that was a good one <laughs> literally also like i don't know how old the kids are but when a kid when you're like oh you've never been with it's like i've never been with anybody yeah, <laughs> yeah. what does even been and with I, mean? I shouldn't yeah. be for a long time yeah. yeah 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 but it was cute like i saw my grandma was like damn you got a point mm. okay <laughs> yeah factual um Rob, do you have any other questions? Did I miss anything? No, but I did find out that that song was only in dreams by Weezer. And, and apparently the whole, like, of Weezer's self-titled album sort of mimics masturbation and its structure. Um, but when you listen to this track from beginning to end, it refers to a guy that lusts after a girl, but she's unattainable, so he can only fantasize, fantasize about her in his dreams. And it slowly builds up over the course of the song, the tempo starts calm and so does the bass line, but they gradually increase over the course of the eight minutes until it culminates in a musically and sexually explosive guitar solo. Wow. So it's mad. 
That. Okay, Weezer. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. wait. If we're talking about songs again, <laughs> here are yeah. some songs about sex that I did not realize were explicitly about sex. Um, Brian Adams, The Summer of 69, was about 69ing. <laughs> <laughs> it was um, hiding in plain sight. Yeah, the Beatles Ticket to Ride was referring to the medical cards German prostit or German sex workers had to prove they didn't have STIs um or about a girlfriend leaving to become a sex worker. Interesting. Mhm. Mm um in Say La Vie by Bewitched, another favorite childhood song, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Um which I was just like they're definitely not saying that. But then this line, I'll huff, I'll puff, I'll blow you away. Our little ears. <laughs> <laughs> like all of these songs have been here the whole time. The whole time. Um, there's also always been songs with moaning, Slave for You. Huge hit when I was dancing at bar mitzvahs. <laughs> you know what's crazy? I've never mm -hmm. been to a bar mitzvah. Oh, my God. Like, my town was so Catholic. I just had never been. And now I feel like I missed out on, like, did. a formative was part a of my huge, youth. <laughs> it was, I mean, did you guys have sweet 16s? Kind of, yeah. I feel like yeah. it was probably similar. But I was like, wow, I wanted to, like. Yeah, it was just school dances every weekend and, so like, fun. so much sober grinding. Yeah, like, that's so hot. And I missed all the of it. Time of my life. Yeah. Fuck. You know what? I should I should bask in the fact that I I did have some really fun times at bar mitzvahs. <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Gratitude prayer Sometimes this week. I think about the things that I have missed out on, and yeah, <laughs> um, and then yeah, there's the, we have a lot of other songs. Maybe we'll make a a playlist or something. Oh, cool! For all of these songs that have to do with sex or songs that sample sex, um, songs that'll make you horny love but yeah i you're the first person that i've ever heard of to make beats with a waveform and i just thought that was so awesome and the song is so good thank you thank you i really appreciate that it like really means the world no you're so welcome and yeah i'm, I'm so happy we got to have you on this episode just to chat about everything because i'm a huge fan now thank you <laughs> i'm so happy that i got to chat <laughs> yay Vaughn, where can everybody find you and your music online? V-O-N is my name. Um, mm -hmm. You can find me on all the places that you listen to music uh, there. And then on the interwebs, I am Vaughn Music everywhere. Um, and then my website, Vaughn Dom Labs, V-O-N-D-O-M Labs, L-A-B-S dot com. Mm -hmm. Is where you can find the more sneaky secret stuff. If you want to come to weird kink shows and whatever else, we have the the extra special scoop there. Unreal. Okay, I have to ask you one more question, which we have to ask everybody after a sexual experience, and this has been one. Um, Vaughn, did you finish? I felt adequately relieved. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs> it was a blast. I, I literally, I was like, can we get her? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a friend tag me in it and I was like, this is so cool. And then I was like, wait, people are actually looking at this. I was like, and, yeah. then, I, and then I like dove into the podcast. and I was like, this is so sick. Like, I'm a big fan of the podcast now, too. So it was really, really special for me. So thank you, sisters. <laughs> thank you again so much for coming. And you guys will see you next time on How Come. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye. It's not you, it's me. I try so hard to finish honestly They say you'll know When you go all the way from A right down to O Oh no I think that i still got a ways to go Oh oh I'm sick of this and I have got to know How come? How come? How come I can't achieve? How come I can't achieve? I'm rolling up my sleeves. I'm rolling up my sleeves. Oh, baby, I believe these guests can help. Cause I can't do it by myself. I wanna just. Um, I do realize that this has been back to back outrage on the internet episodes, and I do think I should go outside. 
However, if you do not have an Instagram and you want to know a little bit more about what the comments section said, or maybe it's so long ago at this point that you're just like, I can't find that video. Here are some other comments that people left. Um, some of them I deleted. Some of them have stayed. Um, also, let me know what you think about me deleting comments. I did make a poll initially to be like, what do you guys think? And the majority was like, just delete them. But then sometimes I'm like, but that's silencing people. But whatever, it's our page. I don't know, whatever. Let us let me know what you think. And then here are some other comments that were left on the video. Yeah, so this person, Faith Berger, said, another example of misogyny in the media. This probably sounds outlandish, so why am I saying this? Well, a young man on TikTok did a very similar thing. He recorded himself orgasming for the beginning of his song. None of the comments were as hateful as these ones here. Not at all. Instead, there was multiple people going to search up the song immediately. So men, why don't you just date men instead of publicly shaming us for the things that you do? Somebody said when people don't know the difference between vaginal muscles and vocal cords, the way reading comprehension is kicking y'all's butts, wave patterns, not moans. When a woman orgasms, the pelvic floor contracts rhythmically. It's unique to each person, but there are a few different types of rhythms. If you want to know what your orgasm looks like, the lioness vibrator has sensors that measure it and show you on a graph. Yay. Yeah, a lot of people already knew. A lot of our listeners already knew. Somebody said, I feel dirty just by hearing this. What the fuck? Someone said, damn, e even EDM is sexualized now. Somebody said, I've been bumping this song for weeks and I just learned this. Wow, it makes it even better. Knew there was a reason I liked it so much. Like, I love that. Someone was like, what the fuck? Why is this in my Instagram discover? I was like, uh, maybe you need to listen to the podcast. Someone said, the song went from fine to gross. I don't want to have to hear moans when I listen to music. There's no moans. Someone wrote feminism in quotes. <sighs> One of our guys said, I, you know what? This is actually impressive. Keep doing you, homie. GG's on making a decent sounding song out of this. LMAO. Someone said, as a musician, this is actually done really well. If you can, speed up the moans for a dope melody that isn't a vibration type sound. But this is actually really cool. I mean, the use of actually. I don't love that. And also, she's not moaning. Anyway. And then someone said, gross, disgusting, hope your father's proud, keep it to yourself, in quotes. Don't listen to them. Clearly, this isn't meant for you, and the world doesn't revolve around you. You can't change others' minds. Just scroll. I mean, most of the scrolling, people are loving it. It's mostly just gifts of people dancing. Keep it going, girl. Love this. Wow, this is fire, the idea and the outcome. Oh, it's everything. Y'all, this is impressive, not gross. Like, you wouldn't have known if she didn't say anything. Also, I don't want to think of that while listening to music. Take a look at all of the actually sexually explicit songs that are popular that most people have heard or listened to. And someone said, if y'all find this gross, I'm super sad for your partners. Kind of you to assume they have partners. Um, you guys, if you want to listen to episodes without commercials... Go to patreon.com slash how come it's a six dollar tier and it's all the episodes without any commercials, including episodes with video that are totally unedited. Patreon.com slash how come. <gasps> oh, no, I forgot to ask her about my favorite comment, which is why is the boy so tiny? Because the song is tiny boy. I don't know. Maybe we can get her back to ask. Maybe it's like Honey Von Shrunk the boy. Maybe she emasculated him and now he's a tiny boy. I don't know. Tiny boy.